so in our previous lecture we had a brief revision of what complex numbers were and why people felt the need to define such a number okay or such numbers then we talked about geometrical objects like circles and disks and half planes so this was something new okay half planes and how we can represent them as inequalities or in equations involving complex numbers okay and then we saw few terms <coughs> such as open set and connected set okay and, and we also noted that if we have a set which is open then its complement has to be closed okay so any set which is both open as well as connected is what is known as a domain okay then we defined a complex function in a way similar to we uh, in a way similar to what we how we define a real variable function okay so you may you may treat it as a rule which takes in a complex number and spits out another complex number okay and we also saw what is the complex exponential function what are complex sin and cosine functions what is the complex logarithmic function and then we have also seen hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine functions okay <clears throat> then at the end we saw how we can graph a complex function okay now the main thing here is we need four axes okay and because we don't have four axes we take the help of two planes the first plane is the z plane okay so the values that the function takes okay these are the input values or domain of the function okay and then the associated w values are plotted on the second plane which is w plane okay and we saw the example of the function w equal to z square so like the input has both real and imaginary parts the output too has both real and imaginary parts okay so this is what we had seen in our last lecture let us now begin the actual differential calculus part okay so in this section we are going to define the terms limit continuity and differentiability for functions of complex variable functions of a single complex variable okay now we already know how we define the limit formally with the help of epsilon delta definition okay so we are going to take the help of the same epsilon delta definition here and we will also take the help of modulus of the complex number set okay and then once we define the limit of a function then it is not too difficult to define continuity at that point okay differentiability well the idea of difference quotient remains the same so when you when you studied the derivative of a single variable function then what was the different co difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x upon h yes and then when when we take the limit of this as h, as h tends to 0 if the limit exists we call that limit as the derivative okay so we'll see a similar difference quotient here too in complex variable case and then we will see a very useful formula involving partial derivatives to find the derivative of functions okay and then of course we will solve some problems which will ask us to calculate the limit using the epsilon delta definition look for the continuity of the function at that point whether it is continuous and then the differentiability part okay now if we go to real calculus okay we seldom solve problems on functions which are nowhere differentiable for example if we define 
or if we recall the function f of x as mod of x we we say that it is differentiable everywhere except at the point x equal to 0 okay so there are many other functions too which which may not which aren't differentiable at infinitely many points but we cannot say that the function is nowhere differentiable okay for example consider the fractional part function okay now because this has infinitely many points where the function is discontinuous automatically it is not differentiable at infinitely many points but again we cannot say that it is nowhere differentiable okay so the commonly studied example where the function is nowhere differentiable is this f of x is equal to 0 if x is rational and f of x is 1 if x is irrational okay now these are examples which we do not study in great detail however when we come to uh, functions of complex variables we can uh, state many examples which are pretty simple okay and these functions will be nowhere differentiable all right you already know the function but i'll not tell you that right now we will now see each and every topic one by one all right so the first two concepts that we are going to see today are limit and or limit of a function and continuity okay now the epsilon delta definition that you already know of limit of a function we are going to extend it to complex numbers okay but this time we will not be considering the intervals on the x axis but we will talk about neighborhoods treating them to be circular regions okay therefore we define the limit in the following way the notation is the same so limit of some function f of z as z tends to the complex number z naught okay we call this limit as l okay if and then the usual statement follows for every epsilon greater than 0 okay see although we are in the domain of complex numbers epsilon is still a real number okay so for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists another real number delta which is also positive okay so both epsilon and delta are real numbers okay so we call the limit of f of z as z tends to z naught as l if for every a positive epsilon there exists corresponding positive delta such that okay for every z not necessarily equal to z naught we will talk about that in the continuity part okay so if we consider a neighborhood of z naught okay which neighborhood delta neighborhood of z naught okay so see this is now this is the point where our uh, terms of open set disks all those things will come into play okay so look at this part for all z or or for all complex numbers z in the delta neighborhood of z naught okay which means we are going to consider an open circular disk centered at z naught with radius delta okay <clears throat> and as i told you earlier we call it the delta neighborhood of z naught okay we have mod of f of z minus l which is considered to be the limit less than epsilon okay so this definition is something which you already are familiar with the only difference is when we talk about functions of a single variable when we say delta neighborhood of x naught we are on the real axis okay so if this is our x naught the open interval that we consider is often 
this okay but this time we are not interested in that open interval we will consider an open okay disk okay or open circular region all right everything else is same there we considered <coughs> real numbers in this interval x not minus delta to x not plus delta now we are considering complex numbers in the interval mod of z minus z not less than delta okay now this definition is very simple provided you understand the original epsilon delta definition what could the informal way be to interpret this closer you go to z not okay but a uh, closer you go to z not but you don't actually reach there okay let me put it in this way closer you go to z not but not exactly there the functions value f of z goes closer and closer to l okay see now this is what this is telling you is f of z may not be defined at z not in fact this is the reason why we study limits so every time when we are solving a limit problem f of z either will not be defined at that point or it will be defined by a different rule okay so f of z may might be a piecewise defined function okay so let's now discuss the diagram if you start coming closer to z not okay in any direction Okay, closer you go to z not, closer the values of f of z will be to the limit l. Okay, this is the lower case limit, and here we are calling it as upper limit, upper case limit. Both are the same. Okay, so you can see that if currently we are at this point z, the associated point in the w plane is f of z, which lies in the epsilon neighborhood of the complex number l ha one more thing l can be a complex number okay the only two things which are not complex here are epsilon and delta f of z is is a complex function z not is a complex number which doesn't mean that it cannot be a real number it can be a real number okay but in its most in its most general sense it is going to be a complex number f of z z not and l complex epsilon and delta positive real so let us go to the problem in this problem we are going to find the limit of a complex variable function by using the epsilon delta definition okay so the question says prove that limit of f of z as z tends to i or 0 plus i is negative to where f of z is given by a polynomial in z okay so when we have real polynomials the coefficients as well as the variable x takes real values and when we have a complex polynomial both the coefficients and the variable can take complex values okay for example the coefficient of z squared here is 1 and the coefficient of z here is i so this is still a polynomial in z okay so f of z is z squared plus i times z before we proceed let us quickly check whether the limit is indeed negative to by direct substitution this is what we usually do in any limit problem okay now because f of z is is a polynomial we directly substitute i in the place of z so if we do it z squared will be i squared and i times z will again be i times i i squared is minus 1 
right and i into i is again minus 1 so negative 2 <coughs> so as far as the direct evaluation part is concerned we have already got our answer but we would now like to prove it using the definition okay so let us start applying the epsilon delta definition and for this what we are going to do is we are going to write down everything in the known terms okay so we need three things we need the function which is z squared plus i z we need the limit we know the value of the limit negative 2 and we know z naught at what point are we interested in finding the limit okay so our job now is to prove that <coughs> for every positive real number epsilon there exists another real number a positive real number delta such that if the modulus of z minus z naught lies between 0 and delta then the modulus of f of z minus l is less than epsilon okay let me again remind you that epsilon and delta are still real numbers they are not complex numbers okay all right <clears throat> so the very first step in in any epsilon delta definition problem is to assume that epsilon is given and then we start with the expression mod of f of z minus l or in the single variable calculus real variable calculus we start with f of x minus l okay so what is f of z here now f of z here is z squared plus i z yes and what is the limit limit is minus 2 so this is f of z minus l now all our efforts will be focused on obtaining the factor z minus i now what is the reason behind this because z naught is i so we would like to have the factor z minus z naught in our expression inside the modulus okay <coughs> now we will first try to factorize this quadratic expression which results when you subtract minus 2 from f of z okay so it is z squared plus i z plus 2 and if you actually solve the quadratic equation by the formula then you are going to get the roots as minus b plus or minus root of b squared minus 4ac okay so you will get eventually minus i plus or minus 3i okay because this is negative 9 and upon 2 okay so there are two roots now if you take plus 3i then the root will be i and if you take minus uh, minus 3i then the root will be minus 2i okay <clears throat> now this will help us in obtaining the factors of the quadratic expression okay so the factors will be z minus the first root into z minus the second root using the properties of the absolute value we can write it as mod of z minus i into mod of z plus 2i okay i and minus 2i all right and see now we have got z minus i here but we would like to get it even in the second case okay so for that let us subtract i and add i so we will get mod of z minus i plus 3i okay all right now the next step is important okay what we are now going to do is we are going to use the triangle inequality okay in the context of complex numbers so what does the triangle inequality say the inequality says that mod of z1 plus z2 is always less than or equal to mod of z1 plus mod of z2 all right now what we are going to do is we are going to apply it on the second part here okay so mod of f of z minus l we have successfully simplified it to mod of z minus i into mod of z minus i plus 3i okay we will keep this part unchanged we will not change it okay but now we will introduce the less than or equal to sign due to the triangle inequality okay and we are going to treat z1 as z minus i and z2 as 3i okay so mod of z1 plus z2 has to be less than or equal to mod of z1 plus mod of z2 keep the first term as it is that is mod of z minus i so write it as it is don't change it but mod of 3i is 3 
okay modulus so it is now less than or equal to mod of z minus i times mod of z minus i plus 3 now please try to understand the significance of this step this actually allows us okay this actually allows us to bring in delta okay we will see how first important statement is if mod of z minus i into mod of z minus i plus 3 is less than epsilon that means we will we are now saying that let this be less than epsilon okay this whole thing if it is less than epsilon then automatically mod of f of z minus l will be less than epsilon yes okay and now we will yet again take the help of quadratic expression okay so let us assume that mod of z minus isp which which is appearing twice here okay so if we assume this to be p then we will get an inequality in the form p into p plus 3 less than epsilon okay or p squared plus 3p minus epsilon is less than 0 okay now we can solve the associated quadratic equation which is p squared plus 3p minus epsilon equal to 0 to get the roots or values of p as minus 3 or minus b plus or minus root of b squared minus 4ac or minus 4 epsilon upon 2 okay we will consider only the so called positive root okay so we are going to consider p as minus 3 plus we will not consider the minus sign plus root of 9 minus 4 epsilon divided by 2 okay now this is important pay attention if mod of z minus i becomes less than our chosen value okay what conclusion can we now draw if mod of z minus i is less than our value of p okay then can we say that this is going to be less than epsilon yes okay now if this is going to be less than epsilon then we have what we wanted okay so we can just call that positive root to be p hmm? and now we have an explicit formula to get delta once epsilon is known isn't it so given an epsilon we can always find delta such that if mod of z minus i lies between 0 and uh, well delta then we will always have mod of f of z minus l less than epsilon okay because we now have an explicit relationship between delta and epsilon okay so this solves the problem let us also solve the related continuity problem all right question two show that f of z which is the same function in our previous problem is continuous at z equal to y we have already proved that the limit is negative to using the definition okay now recall the definition of continuity when the limit is equal to the value of the function at that point then we say that the function is continuous okay so calculate f of i in fact this is what we have done when we evaluated the limit directly okay f of i is i squared plus i into i which is negative 2 yes therefore the condition for continuity is satisfied the limit of the function f of z as z tends to i is actually equal to the value of the function at z equal to i and hence the continuity is established and as polynomials are continuous in the real variable or in the real domain so are polynomials continuous in the complex domain okay so we have now solved <coughs> one problem on limits and continuity usually in the examination they do not ask you to get the limits of a complex function or limit of a complex function at a point using the epsilon delta definition but if they ask then you should know how to proceed now the definition of a differentiable function or de the definition of the derivative of a complex function involves the same difference quotient
which you used in the real variable calculus okay so you introduced a small change in your independent variable and you observed what happens or what happened to this ratio okay f of x plus delta x minus f of x upon delta x we are going to do the same thing the difference is both z and delta z are now complex numbers sorry both z and delta z are now complex numbers okay so let us read the definition the function f of z is is differentiable at at a point z equal to z not if the following limit exists so again derivatives have been defined using limits okay i'll first explain you the second definition then i'll go to the first one okay so this is limit as delta z tends to zero of f of z not plus delta z minus f of z not upon delta z very similar to this okay when we talk about derivative of a function in general we we take x here but if you are interested in the value of the derivative at a point and if you are finding it using the first principles we add the subscript signifying that we we now know a value of x okay just like that if if we want to check the differentiability of a function f of z at z not we will introduce a small change in z not okay now this change is a complex change okay so delta z is actually some change in x plus i times some change in y okay minus f of z not upon delta z and if we set delta z to be z minus z not then automatically we will get the first definition okay limit as z tends to z not f of z minus f of z not upon z minus z not and we also use the prime notation <coughs> okay see we may also write d by dz of f of z or f prime z okay all the rules of differentiation they are same u plus v u minus v oh, okay i shouldn't say u v now addition rule subtraction rule multiplication rule division rule and all the formulas as well okay so same rules of differentiation now sometimes what happens is they actually ask us to find the derivative of the function with respect to z okay not with respect to x or y but we can take the help of a useful formula okay now now this formula can be applied only when the derivative of the function exists okay and and this is very similar to very similar to the two path test that we applied to check for existence of limit okay well i should say non existence of the limit because the two path test doesn't establish the existence it is capable of establishing only the non existence of the limit okay meaning if we if we get two different values of limits along two different paths of a two variable function or a multi variable function in general we say that the limit doesn't exist okay now this this formula that i'm going to tell you is going to work only when f dash of z or f prime z already exists okay and this the, the, i mean there are two formulas first is we can okay so let us say this is z not okay and if we draw the circle if we consider the circular neighborhood of z not then there are infinitely many paths towards this point okay but two prominent paths are the horizontal one and the vertical one obviously okay so when you when you reach z not along a vertical path okay you can be sure that there is no change in x or the real part the real part is always constant and when you approach it along a horizontal line then the imaginary part is constant so there is no change in y or delta y is zero yes okay so if you if you simply remember these things then the formula d by dz of f of z gets converted to daba u by daba x that means find the partial derivative of the real part of the function with respect to x plus i times partial derivative of v with respect to x note that both times we are differentiating with respect to x okay and not with respect to y 
okay but you can also use the other formula if you approach the the points are not vertically okay and then the formula is dab v by dab y minus i times dab u by dab y okay now i recommend using the first formula because if the function f of z is u plus i v okay you can very easily get the derivative by just differentiating both functions functions with respect to u <coughs> and without having i mean without requiring any change in the positions okay instead if we try to use the second formula then the real part is actually partial derivative of v with respect to y and the imaginary part is actually minus partial derivative of u with respect to y okay now you can also remember the first formula and get the second one from what we call as the cauchy riemann equations which we are going to see now okay in a while but it is important to understand what we mean by differentiability for functions of single complex variable it again means existence of the limit of the difference quotient okay we also have same rules of differentiation but we have a useful formula to find the derivative okay well if at all the function is not expressed in terms of z but in terms of x and y okay all right so let us now solve a problem by the first principles okay by this formula highlighted in the pink color and the other formula which requires us to swap the real and the imaginary parts and then get the derivatives with respect to y okay so let us take the simple function z squared and find its derivative okay we we know that d by dz of z squared must be 2z okay method one very simple introduce a change in z okay so and 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 call that change as delta z so if prime z is limit as delta z tends to 0 of f of z plus delta z minus f of z okay the numerator divided by delta z okay use the formula a plus b bracket squared z squared plus 2z delta z plus delta z squared okay and then minus z squared okay cancel z squared and what you will get is 2z delta z plus delta z squared split it here cancel delta z from the first term we'll get 2z let delta z be there in the numerator of the second term okay so you'll automatically get 2z okay by direct substitution of delta z equal to 0 okay so we, we knew this derivative of z squared is 2z okay now let us apply the shortcuts okay second method will make use of the formula which we have highlighted in the pink color right dab u by dab x plus i times dab u by dab x and for this we need to know what u and v are okay now if the function is z squared or x plus i by the whole squared we can very easily identify u and v okay again use a plus b bracket squared real sorry real part is x squared minus y squared yes and the imaginary part is 2 times x y okay so we have now got u in terms of x and y and v in terms of x and y okay so if we have the function f of z in terms of u and v we can use this these formulas otherwise if we directly have the function f of z in terms of z we can use the first one okay all right now f prime z is partial derivative of u with respect to x this is the real part okay so differentiate this with respect to x you will get 2x yes plus i times dab v by dab x so differentiate v with respect to x again so we will get 2y yes take two common you will get x plus i y which is again in turn equal to z so f prime z is equal to 2z by the method 2 now we will replace dab u by dab x by dab v by dab y and dab v by dab x by minus dab u by dab y to get the same answer okay so the second formula 
real part is partial derivative of v with respect to y imaginary part is negative partial derivative of u with respect to y okay again same things u and v derivative of u with respect to y minus 2y derivative of v with respect to y 2x okay but remember now don't write dabba v by dabba y as the imaginary part okay it it becomes the real part okay and negative of dabba u by dabba y becomes the real uh, imaginary part so that is positive 2y again take two common x plus i y so two times z okay so by the three methods different methods i would say we have got the same answer for the derivative of z squared okay so you may summarize this now okay if if f of z is given okay in terms of z okay go directly for f of f prime z okay and if f of z is given in terms of u and v use the formula i would say use partial derivatives okay and we have seen that through an example let us now solve another example wherein we will show that the complex conjugate function is nowhere differentiable okay fine so question 2 prove that z bar or complex conjugate of any complex number is differentiable nowhere now before we go to the proof let us uh, remind ourselves that z bar is defined for all complex numbers okay and is also continuous so what makes it differentiable nowhere let's find out again we are going to assume that we are finding the derivative at a point z not okay we are not putting any restriction on z not so let z not be x not plus i y not okay now it is enough to establish the path dependence of the limit okay So we'll consider the difference quotient once again. F of z plus delta z minus f of z upon delta z. Okay, we are not taking the limit as of now. We will just try to simplify this. Okay. Now, the complex number z plus delta z will have the real part x plus delta x. Okay. And the imaginary part y plus delta y by the rules of addition on the set c okay now if we want f of z plus delta z okay then we would we should take the complex conjugate of this number yes so complex conjugate means take change the sign of the imaginary part okay yes so this is f of z plus delta z part Minus f of z. Now this is clear. Okay, minus x minus i y, and divided by. This is also important. Delta z is the complex number. Delta x plus i delta y. Okay, and if you simplify the numerator, okay, if you simplify the numerator, x will go. Okay, and <coughs> i delta i y will also go. Sorry. Yes, minus i y and plus i. So what remains in the numerator is delta x minus i delta y, and in the denominator this will come as it is. Okay. Now let us apply the two-path test. If we follow the horizontal path, okay. Towards z not, what is changing? the imaginary part is changing but the real part is not changing oops sorry if we follow any horizontal path then real part changes but imaginary part doesn't change 
yes so if the imaginary part doesn't change then delta y is zero and then the derivative becomes one because we now have limit as delta x tends to zero of delta x upon delta x okay this is one now if we follow any if we follow the vertical path wherein we don't change the image uh, the real part but the imaginary part changes we can now take delta x to be zero so we need to consider delta y okay so along the vertical line real part of z equal to x not the derivative is now in the form derivative as delta y tends to zero you can cancel uh, i so you'll get negative delta y upon delta y which is negative one okay now as we said earlier in at the beginning of our proof that we are not putting any restriction on z not okay meaning the result that we have got here okay the result 1 and minus 1 these two derivatives will be the same no matter what complex number you choose okay so therefore we have successfully proved that the complex conjugate function although is defined for all complex numbers is differentiable nowhere okay if you remember in the introduction i told you in in the complex domain we can find a lot of very simple looking functions which are not even differentiable at a single point and one of them is the complex conjugate function